Hello, everyone. My name is Lindawi Davis. I am an employee of Google, of course. I work specifically within an engineering org focused in on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm so, so happy today uh, because we have a very, very special guest here, uh, New York Times bestselling author, Mateo Ascarapur. And I will correct that name one more time, uh, probably in just a moment. But we have the wonderful Mateo here who is going to be talking about his debut novel, Black Buck. Uh, Black Buck tells the propulsive satirical story of the rise and fall of a young black salesman in an all white tech startup. It's a story of how one man battles racism and microaggressions to get to the top of the cult like startup. When it becomes clear he's the token black guy, he hatches a plan to help people of color infiltrate America's sales team, setting off a chain of events that forever changes the game. Now that summary right there, I imagine sounds very familiar to many, many people out there. It sounds very familiar to myself Instead of it being sales, it's tech, it's marketing, it's the financial space, et cetera. Not yet 30, Mateo has spent the majority of his career leading sales teams and experienced much of the world of startups you see in the book. Before writing Black Buck, Mateo realized he had been avoiding writing about themes closest to his life, race, sales, and startups. I'm gonna stop right there and I'm gonna have Mateo introduce himself. Hey, Lindawi, what an amazing introduction. Thank you for having me. Everyone who's watching from their homes, offices, wherever you are, appreciate you being here. Um, I mean, you really you really summed it up. You know, this is my first novel, came out January 5th this year. It actually came out today in the UK. Yeah. And I'm just grateful for everyone who is supporting the journey, who is reading the book, and who is having discussions around the themes present in it. Uh, couldn't be more grateful. We appreciate you, Mateo, for being here and taking out the time. You have been on quite the tour, which is so good. I just want to throw out some snaps for that because uh, this is not <laughs> this is not a profession for the faint of heart, and you are doing such a beautiful job here. Um, I want to kind of jump in and just kind of talk about your background. So, where are you originally from, and how do you think where you're from really influenced? where you are today in terms of this book being um, coming out in January and how you kind of started your journey in tech. Definitely. So I'm originally from Long Island. Uh, that's where I was born and raised and lived for the first 16 years of my life before moving to New York City for college, where I've lived, you know, for a large majority of my life in different places. I wouldn't have been able to write this book without mm -hmm. where I grew up, um, where I grew up you know, I felt, uh, and this is going to be, you know, cliche in many ways, but I felt like an other in many of yeah. the circles that I found myself in. You know, after a certain age, when you're in certain classes, right? Only black kid in the honors classes, right? Only black yeah. kid on the soccer team, this, that, and the other. Then your friends groups, you know, after a certain age are just those people comprised of who you're in your classes with, who you play sports with, um, or who are in your neighborhood. Um, so I grew up in many ways feeling like an other and that forced me into myself. Yeah. And that forced me to become observant, very observant, um, not just to be aware of what was happening, but to also protect myself and so mm -hmm. that I could survive. So that if someone was going to say something, then I could be real quick and fire back so that yeah. I wouldn't internalize it and be hurt. Um, so all of that really gave me um, what I found to be a valuable perspective on life. Um, and my parents, they're both immigrants. My mom is from Jamaica mm -hmm. and my grandma from Jamaica also raised yeah. in the home and yeah. taught me the power of the written word and, and, and how powerful it was to also read. Uh, my father is from Iran, so he brought a very different perspective to our house, but he was more low key about his yeah. background. And he was like an honorary Jamaican man. <laughs> you <Okay. know? laughs> um, so, so all of that really culminated in me having uh, a strong work ethic from seeing my parents and what they did uh, to provide for myself and my, my four brothers. And uh, yeah, you know, there, there's many other ways that we got to where we are today, but that's a little bit about my background. Well, what I love about all of that is that it really kind of leans into that quintessential behavior of people who were New Yorkers, but yeah. also for folks that are transplants like myself. You know, yeah. you and I were talking previously about uh, this nature versus nurture when it comes to grinding and understanding how to get from point A to point B and what New York, which 
for the most part, is kind of like a character in our own lives when you yeah. live here. Um, what do you think the impact of living here and having that sense about yourself of grinding and getting from point A to point B, but what about that is so important in the context of survival, right, to your point, and to being successful for yourself? Sure. Well, pff, what do they say? If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Again, right. cliche, a little corny, but I found to be very true, right? I came yeah. to New York City uh, when I was 16, and I saw people falling off quick. We, you know, I was at New York University, and some people who I was there within the first week were gone after the first month. Or yeah. some people before the end of the first year were out because they didn't realize the burden or responsibility that living in a place that is so fast paced and so individualistic while having its communities, of course, um, would place on you. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you come here or you go to you go to a, a university that doesn't have sprawling greens and people throwing footballs and playing catch and keggers. You got to find out who you are real quick or else you get consumed in this ever growing and ever shifting sea of a city. Right. So right. for me and for a lot of people who I still, you know, fortunately call friends from, from my time, you know, when I was younger coming here and, and then attending university, what bonds all of us is that we had to figure out what success meant to us. Mm -hmm. And this is also present in the book. Right. Yeah, when you chase definitions of success that aren't in line with your moral compass or, or aren't in line with your true ambitions, things could work out really well, but bad things could also take place. So yeah, my perfect. friends and I all had to figure out what success meant to us, figure out the steps that it would take to get there while also understanding that there would be many missteps. Yeah. But knowing that even though we live in a place that I recently described as individualistic, you have your tribe. Mm -hmm. And your tribe is who holds you down. And it could be your friends. It could be your families. It could be anyone you meet along the way that allows yeah. you to be you and genuinely cares for you. So um, I wouldn't have been able to write Black Buck in any other city, I believe. I, I really think that, not just because it takes place in New York City, but as we were discussing yesterday, just you know, you and, you and I, mm -hmm. it's the feeling of yeah. New York. And this isn't to say that I won't bounce eventually, right. but right. it's the feeling of I want to make it and I want to survive and thrive and hopefully keep as much as myself intact along the way. Yeah, I think that that's probably one of the bigger themes too within the book, just trying to maintain your own self integrity, mm. um, at, but while also still sustaining that level of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you feel like you're in a crazy place of being the only or feeling like other in professional spaces, or even in entertainment spaces, or even in spaces where you've been invited, yep. uh, that mindset it oftentimes kicks in where it's damn near do or die, right? Yep. I think we had touched on that yesterday. Um, and it sometimes it comes out and it plays out in a behavioral sense where um, you're like, wait a minute, let me put a wall up really quick because how you just came at me mm -hmm. <laughs> in this situation <laughs> is not 100. Mm -hmm. um, so let's dig into that a little bit um, in terms of sales, that field, survival in the field. Talk to us a little bit about your experience, right? And how you tie that to the main character, Darren, in uh, Black Book. Yeah, my, my experience in sales was wild, <laughs> as it is for many people, especially working in a startup, because what, what a lot of people who begin working in sales at startups don't always realize is that startups are figuring it out along the yeah. way. You mm -hmm. would think that there would be a playbook at, at this point. And there are different pieces of literature or different so-called gurus who profess to have the answer. You mm -hmm. need to pour this many leads in at right. this time, make this many calls, flip them into this many opportunities, and then they pour down the funnel and it rains money. But <laughs> um, startups are not a monolith, even though sometimes we speak of them as they are. And even myself, you know, falls in, fall into that, uh, that trap every once in a while. Um, but yeah, my experience was wild. I didn't, I didn't say I want to be in sales. That's not how it went down. I didn't grow up thinking that I wanted to be like a Don Draper type person or, right, or anything right. like that. Um, I was working as a community manager, social media manager at this startup. And then as any startup, you know, typically would, they said, we need to monetize. So the CEO said, Mateo, at this point, I was 21, about to turn 22. He said, you're positive. You know, you have an energy about yourself. Pick up a yeah. phone. 
so mm. pick up a phone. And it was a crash course that was one of the most intense periods of my life because at that point in the startup, there were about 20 people yeah. and they were all doing non-sales things. You know how it is in these organizations, people are quiet, just chatting, you know, doing this, that, and the other, marketing, right. engineering. And then it was me in the middle of this office in, um, I guess what would be uh, Gramercy or Upper Union Square, just, mm -hmm. <coughs> hello. This is Mateo. Like, I had marbles in my mouth. Everyone was, everyone was listening to me. I was shook. I almost got fired many times, but right. eventually it clicked. And then when it clicked, I was closing some smaller deals, but I found that as the team was growing, my niche would be in growing the sales development team, mm -hmm. right? And for, for those yeah. who don't know, sales development, they are the people calling inbound leads, the people who raise their hands via a form or they download a white paper or what have you. It's always murky <laughs> in right. terms of who's actually inbound. And then the cold callers. So the team grew from just me to around 90 people in two, two and a half years. And I was 24 wow. now managing 30 of them, you know, yeah. maybe six figures, but also entering what we now have the language to call the sunken place. Okay. Like Darren in the book, I yeah. was losing myself. I was mm -hmm. screening my mother's calls. The, the, the homies I, I had known from the university, the ones who, who I say I'm fortunate to still be friends now, were looking right. at me funny. And I was on some, you don't understand, you don't get it. Like we're changing the world as, as many, you know, startup uh, acolytes and, and um, CEOs and leaders say. So where Darren and I differ, though, is we entered the world of sales in different places. Mm -hmm. um, our trajectories were slightly different. Um, and we're also just different people. There, there right. are similarities, but we're, we're also different. But we both did get caught up and then had to find our way back to ourselves. Right. I wonder, thinking about this a little bit more and diving a bit deeper into yeah. how you thought about writing this book, um, I know that you didn't intend for it to be a satire. Mm. But once you realized that it was going to be that, um, did you feel like there was some sort of deeper responsibility in telling this story? But also to your point about kind of making this into a um, sales manual, almost mm -hmm. like a how to, but don't do that situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the book contains satirical elements, right? I've never been one to call it. Uh, a satire um, yeah. other people have, and I'm okay with it. I completely understand. There are satirical elements. There are seemingly absurd elements, but I've also found, you know, through having published this book about four months ago, absurdity is in the eye of the beholder, <laughs> right? There are some people who read this book and say, would something like this, maybe not this specific thing, but would something like this actually happen? And then what I found is that the people who are furthest removed from what it's like to be black or brown in this nation Yep. are more prone to believing that some of what happens in the book is fantastic yeah. or completely absurd or completely imaginary where you read the book and you're like, okay, mm -hmm. maybe I didn't experience this specific thing, but I've experienced something just like it Oh yeah, or as surreal or as bizarre. So that's just a little bit in terms of satire. You know, th this book is an imprint of my brain is how it works. Mm -hmm. There's tragedy that ensues in the world and I feel it and I internalize it. And then in the same turn, same turn, I see the, the wildness mm -hmm. and the humor and to use the word again, absurdity in some ways of, of how so much of what happens in real life is ripe for, for humor, absurdity, and, and to depict on the page. But yeah. the responsibility that I felt when writing this book was not to speak for all black people. Yeah. Um, to speak from my experience, which I think would translate into others, and to speak for the very specific experience of this young man named Darren at this specific time in his life in this workplace. I hoped that it would translate into other people's experience so that they would feel seen and empowered and know that they're not crazy, overly mm -hmm. sensitive or paranoid when they perceive something to be amiss in these spaces. And that is how I define success today. When I get a DM, when I get an email and someone says, you don't know me, but you wrote about me in your book mm. and I feel less alone because of it. And I say, yes, that <laughs> is what I wanted. Cool. New York Times bestseller. Yeah, I wanted that. Check. Mm -hmm. Dope. Uh, you know, potential Hollywood movements. Yeah, I wanted that. Cool. But nothing, mm -hmm. all of it pales in comparison to getting that message from someone who says, I've been here and I know what it's like to just take it until you make it. 
right. and how much you lose and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing that there's so many things that we could take apart. There's a lot going on. <laughs> I <laughs> everything that was said in this book resonated with me, mm. starting with the character of Ma. Mm. Um, loving, encouraging, the mother of Darren in the book, uh, the kind of mother that, um, you know, you look at your own mother and you're like, yeah, that's her. She may yeah. not be Jamaican, but she black. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, or she's, you know, uh, Latinx plus, et cetera, mm -hmm. all the brown people yeah. uh, uh, for the most part. And so I think about that character in the sense of um, how important it is to always have that person in your life. And when that person is no longer there, the lessons remain. Yes. At least that's the hope. And so with Darren in this book, you know, he did lose himself. Right. And I think that that is a component in real life, too, when you don't have a tribe, to your point. The most important person in your life is no longer there. You then have to lean on your tribe, but then you can't even trust yourself to trust the tribe. Yeah. Um, and so for you, how important was it to kind of call that factor out as well within the book? Well, it was it was critical. You know, you brought up in an earlier question about how this could be perceived as a how to of mm -hmm. sorts. And I, I did want it to double as a sales manual to be clear, but right. you, you also, you didn't name it, but I believe that you were alluding to the fact that this could be viewed as a cautionary tale as well. Yeah. And it certainly is. There are people who say, Mateo, did Darren have to lose himself in order to be successful? And mm. I said that Darren had to lose himself and become buck in order to become successful in this specific environment. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that he could have retained a sense of self and gone somewhere else that celebrated him. So in highlighting the danger of entering potentially hostile environments where anyone, I'm not just saying black or brown people, it could, mm. it, it, it could come down to sexual orientation, gender expression, religion, and so forth, where you're the only person like you, or at least identifies like you. And if you don't have a solid foundation, chaos could ensue. And mm -hmm. you could get caught up because in some of these environments, it's not always the workplace. It could be sports teams. It could be um, many, many different types of instances. There are temptations. Yes. Certain aspects are very flashy. We see in the book, Darren goes from being a shift supervisor at Starbucks, mm -hmm. making about 19K a year, to being uh, a sales development representative in SDR at a, a startup, making mm -hmm. 65K basically right. overnight. Then there's catered lunches. Then mm -hmm. there's people bringing you out to the clubs. None of this is hyperbolic. Right, <laughs> I right. experienced this myself, you know? So yeah. um, that, that it was important for me to include the impact of having your tribe or not having your tribe so mm -hmm. that people who haven't had these experiences can be better equipped to avoid those pitfalls. And people who have had these experiences and potentially have lost themselves at times know that we're never too far gone, yeah. you know, to, to get back to the better parts of who we are and find, find new parts. I'm so glad that you brought that last part up about you're never too far gone, meaning no one is ever um, beyond the moment of redemption. Yes. And there's always space to come back home, you know, to your tribe, to your parents, to your friends, uh, to religion, if that is your thing, et cetera. Um, yeah. But I kind of want to dig a little bit more into some of these characters. Starting with Rhett. Rhett. Now, when I read about Rhett, I just kept thinking, oh gosh, this guy's going to get punched in his throat. <laughs> um, and um, I don't condone violence, by the way, but I'm sure. just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the state of New York, when you roll up on people and you say crazy stuff, you got to be ready for the response that you're going to get. I don't yes. know if that works that way in other states. I imagine mm. it does. But uh, the, the way he's described in the book, he's a gentleman cologne, his look is together, he would be this, considered the quintessential white man, mm -hmm. uh, handsome, et cetera, well-spoken, et cetera. But his behavior, after giving that opportunity to Darren, uh, clicks into a very dangerous kind of territory. And I think sometimes that when people get into these jobs, whether it's tech, financial, marketing, et cetera, and it's high octane, high behavior, bad behavior, toxic behavior and all of those things are kind of mixed together to your point with 
this high volume of opportunity, free lunches, access, um, it starts to almost feel like the person has permission to be that way. Mm. So for you writing the character of Rhett, um, I don't want to be so singular layered and say, how many Rhett's do you know? But I mm -hmm. do want to ask the question around how have the Rhett's in your own personal life affected you? And why did you throw this into the book in this manner with his descriptives being so strong? Sure. So I think that anyone who has worked um, in an office environment, but more specifically in tech, mm -hmm. is familiar with someone who is like Rhett or at least has you know one or two of his um, characteristics, mm -hmm. right? For, for someone to start a startup, they have to believe that they're going to affect some type of change. Right. And in the most extreme ways, you see people who say, we're changing the world through figuring out how to build a more ergonomic chair. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're not. But you, <laughs> but you see, it takes that type of person to right. then convince one, two, 10, 50, 100, a couple hundred, then a thousand, mm -hmm. um, that they are changing the world through creating a more ergonomic chair that allows people to sit better mm -hmm. and will decrease you know, arthritis when they get older. There's so many different ways that you can spin it. These, right. these messianic figures, and we've seen it's not always just men, even though it, right. it, it more often than not is, but we've seen with Theranos and, and a lot of other um, organizations that it's not always men. Right. Um, but it was important for me to write this character of Rhett as someone who was complex, as someone who on the face, like you're saying, he has all of these quote unquote perfect or standard characteristics of what it's like to be successful. But then I wanted to peel back that mask in a way yeah. and show people what can go on in these organizations when you go beyond the face, when mm -hmm. you go beyond the inspiring character that's giving a TED talk. When you go beyond the person that's featured in Forbes or Bloomberg or, or, or whatever, I wanted to show how messy these organizations can be. Everything yeah. from how you basically employ mass psychology mm -hmm. over hundreds of people, especially hundreds of young people, to yeah. get them focused on a singular goal, yeah. um, to the inherent dangers with venture capitalism, and the pressure that it puts on CEOs that then gets passed on to the uh, people working there to produce, produce, produce. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show all of that, but Rhett, Rhett was important because despite all that happens, I believe that in some ways he did have love for Buck. Yeah. And that, you know, we see at the end that Buck still has love for him in many ways, but Rhett, despite how intelligent he was and how old knowing he thought he was, still had blind spots. So to wrap up, I've had ruts in my own life that have affected me deeply and uh, it wasn't always negative. In yeah. some ways, I believe that if I hadn't crossed paths, crossed paths with some of these uh, individuals, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I love that in the description of that. I, I've had some rets. Uh, I may have had one ret, uh, maybe not to this extreme, but they were more, I'll say Rhonda's and Reese's uh, who, who would pop out of various areas of my professional life. And wow. um, they weren't always ready for the response that they got. Yep. But at the same time, uh, when you're much younger and you're getting into a space and you're just trying to make it, you yourself are not as measured as you could be in your way of moving and navigating these spaces. Um, and that can also get you into trouble. Definitely. Um, Speaking of being more measured and, and, and understanding how to navigate these spaces, what about, and this was ever so slight, but I love that you employed it into the book, which was the name. Hmm. Everyone kept mispronouncing his name, even though his name is not hard to pronounce. Yeah, That was one of the first things. Um, and then the second thing was around who he looked like. And so purposely, I kept laughing every time it came up because the folks that he met in the office uh, had indicated that, like Rhett said, he looked like MLK. Then um, he looked like Sidney Portier. Then he looked like Malcolm X. And I kept thinking, none of those three people look alike in any way, shape, or form. But it does speak to the, the disgusting behavior of being lazy and recognizing Black folks and their characteristics. But it's also just a way to undermine people as well. Yes. Um, 
throwing that into the book, what did, how did that speak to you? And why did, once again, did you want to employ that um, in such a blatant way, but it was also very silent in comedy? Yeah. So in terms of his name and the character of Clyde, who is the VP of sales at this organization, the name of the company is someone, S-U-M-W-N. In, in terms of Clyde calling him Darone, even though his name is just Darren, as you said, very easy to pronounce. That is the first indication that there are going to be people in this organization who have no care for Darren's humanity. Yeah. Who don't care about him, who aren't going to look at him as a person, right. but are going to treat him as an employee. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that there's a difference in the way that, that people uh, manage and, and people just interact with folks whose humanity they don't see. Right. Um, it's been a hot topic. Uh, for the last year or so, but for mm. people like us, we we've just this is our this is our daily life, right? Right. Um, it's just a continuous circle. <laughs> yeah, and it's not to say it's all doom and gloom. I mean, for right. for the people who haven't read this book yet, it's not 400 mm. pages of tragedy and trauma. Not at right, all. Right. I wouldn't be able to write that. It is right. very funny at times. Mm -hmm. Um, and this brings up how all these people say that he looks like everyone from Sidney Poitier to then Drake. I damn near threw an Oprah. <laughs> just to just to throw in the absurdity of it all, but I, I wrote that in because that's happened to me. Yeah, and many people who have read the book, many many black folk especially have read the book, reach out and say, "I've been called these three or four people who look yeah. nothing alike," and I'm like, "Damn, I didn't really know that this was happening for so many people. I'd know that this has just happened in my life, and mm -hmm. I thought that it would be one of those one of those devices um, or points in the book that I could insert humor." But mm -hmm. after the third or fourth time that it would happen, people would begin to question, how funny is this? Yeah. Does this actually happen to people? Mm -hmm. And if they go even deeper, what are the implications for the person who's on the receiving end? Do they feel faceless? Do they feel like there is being a, a lack of humanity placed on them, that they're just a cog on the in a machine, and it doesn't right. matter whether someone says they look like Drake or Dave Chappelle? Mm -hmm. You know, but I wrapped it up. I see that. I see, I see the smile playing on your face. I wrapped it up in humor because I want people who have experienced these things to be able to laugh at them. Yeah. And then I want other people to read it and question um, the distinction between the humor and the horror. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, what it, where it took me when I was reading about those various descriptions of who they thought he looked like, I... I've had that maybe once or twice in my life in the professional space, but really um, I've had it taken to the next level where people uh, literally looked at me, called me another black woman's name. And that black woman was literally 50 feet away, yep. not realizing, uh, well, first of all, how could we ever look alike? We're distinctly different. We're not related. Yep. Um, and so th I think that that's like the biggest thing. Like you brought up such an, a great point around the humanity of it all that you know, people mispronouncing your name, not taking the time to pay attention to that, not asking the right questions. And then of course, calling you by someone else's name um, are all microaggressions, but they're the kind of microaggressions that start to erode a person's spirit. Yep. Uh, you know, so much so, that, which then feeds back into that continuous bad behavior that you feel like you endure in professional spaces. Um, so I was thinking through the hazing that goes on in various spaces, startups, sales spaces, et cetera. Uh, any personal experience that you want to touch on there for folks that are watching who may have experienced some hazing and how did you kind of handle that yourself in those environments? Um, because you do call it out in the book, which again, I don't know where I would be if that was something that ever happened. I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. I mm -hmm. might be where he ends up at the end of the book. But um, for the most part, uh, <laughs> have you experienced any kind of hazing? And you don't have to answer the question, but have you experienced any kind of hazing in the sales space? Um, and what advice would you give to folks if that is something that they've run into? Yeah. Um, no, I wouldn't say that I, I experienced it myself. You know, mm -hmm. you, you asked earlier um, about my experiences in the world of sales. Yeah. I experienced bizarre and surreal racism mm -hmm. where I was growing up when I was younger and as yeah. a teenager, right? This goes back to me saying I was very observant, but I had to be quick so that mm -hmm. someone wouldn't catch me slipping and, and hurt me 
Yeah. Just literally hurt me mentally, physically, and emotionally, more so mentally or, or emotionally than physically. Yeah. Um, so I translated that into the workplace on purpose mm -hmm. to show what even these so-called microaggressions or passive forms of racism can feel like to us. Mm -hmm. They can feel like someone saying, hey, wasn't George Floyd on fentanyl? Yeah. As if he deserved what happened to him, right? How that can feel like, whoa, Scott, we just ate in the cafeteria yesterday. I thought that you were a cool white guy. Now you're saying this, like, whoa, I'm just playing devil's <laughs> advocate. No, you're not, homie. Right. <laughs> like, you know, um, so I wanted to show how it can feel for so yeah. many of us. But mm -hmm. when I was in the, the world uh, of startups and sales, firmly embedded, doing the whole 16 hours a day and, and all of that, um, it was intense. And there was a ton of testosterone mm -hmm. and at times there would be intimidation and um, a lot of psychological warfare. Right. But because of how I came in, I didn't experience it a lot. Right. right? Um, I was a top dog for a long time at a young age. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if someone was coming into an interview, it was me employing tricks. Yeah to try to like reel them in or try to make them feel by the end of the interview that they would be lucky to take this job for $40,000 a year and give their entire lives to it, which wasn't true. Right. But I was lost in the sauce mm -hmm. and um, I was a bigger cog in the machine as well until I yeah. woke up, which happened around 2016. Right. Um, but what I would say to anyone that has experienced this or is experiencing this is if you feel that something's off, it probably is. Yeah. To, yeah. Do not let anyone gaslight you. The amount of times right. that I, I was even gaslit when, when I was coming out of my funk and saying, maybe we should do this or maybe we should change things. What do you mean? All right. Have you started a company before? Are you the one that have you looked at the numbers? Mm -hmm. Do you know what our this, that, and the other, this, that, and the other, the conversion rates are, you know? Yeah. Um, so do not let anyone gaslight you. Do not believe that any place is too good for you to leave. Do not believe that it's on you to articulate what's yeah. going on. Maybe it could be if you're built like that, but not everyone is. Right. It's also okay if you just want to bounce. Mm -hmm. um, number four is I would say, find your tribe within the workplace if possible, a couple people right. that you can speak to who will validate you and hear you out. And again, not look to dismiss your feelings mm -hmm. and thoughts, mm -hmm. um, get things in writing. And lastly, understand mm -hmm. that you are a value, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. Right. You are a value and that, that which makes you different does not need to be stomped out, does not need to be told, uh, Sally, mm, this thing that you're doing with your hair, not a culture fit. You don't need to tone down who you are. Who you are has mm -hmm. got you to where you are now and will get you to where you're going to go. Again, it's delicious. Um, it's <laughs> delicious. I <I'm> <laughs> As a foodie, I appreciate that. I know you're a foodie. You told me. <laughs> I am a foodie. I'm thinking about food right now, Mateo. Right. Um, so <laughs> throughout the book, you and I were just trying to figure out. I was actually you weren't trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure it out throughout the book. You've had these bolded statements, right, where you mm -hmm. come outside of the character. Um, and I was trying to think of the perfect way to address it. But you had called them direct addresses to the reader, right? Yes. Where you're speaking directly to the reader. So mm -hmm. um, to give people a visual of what that means, it would be like um, if Mateo and I were filming and then all of a sudden the camera cuts to me and I just start talking directly to the camera, yeah. that would be like a direct address, right? We've seen yep. this on reality TV and some films. Yeah. So yeah. what was your intention with a lot of these direct addresses? And I just wanna kind of read one off to everyone because Ooh. There's many that I wrote down, but I'm pulling up the book. Uh, no matter how much it hurts, never let short-term frustration disrupt long-term gain. Sales is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. Talk to us a little bit about that particular direct address and then maybe break into what you started to talk about earlier around this kind of not being meant to be a manual, but you just wanted people to have that additional insight. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for reading that. Uh, with that specific address, it, it's related to um, the concept of having a short-term memory yeah. in the world of sales, right? Uh, it, it depends on what your quota is and if it's monthly or quarterly, but the number is always going to refresh eventually. Mm -hmm. 
week to week or, or month to month or quarter to quarter. So if you are getting hung up on, and no pun intended, whoa, but if you're yeah. getting hung up on every phone call, right, right. it doesn't right. go well, then it's not going to work out for you. You need to have a short-term memory. If you make a hundred calls a day and mm -hmm. things are changing these days where it's not about quantity, but more so the quality of an interaction and not everyone's just solely focused on the phone. But for the sake of this example, if you're making a hundred calls a day and 98 people don't pick up, and you're right. dwelling on those 98 people rather than the two successes, uh, it, it's not going to bode well for you, right? You mm -hmm. have to have the big picture in mind. And that's what helped me when I was rising up in the world of sales. I would just keep going and know that there was a bigger picture at play and that I had to live in that bigger picture and yeah. that it would be advantageous of me for, for me to, advantageous to me, for me to try to connect what I believe to be my life's purpose mm -hmm. with my role of picking up the phone, of qualifying people, of passing them off, of closing them, and then managing them, directing, and so forth. So that's where right. that specific uh, direct address to the reader came from. But more broadly, I, I, it was after the fourth draft that I said, let me start you know, writing directly to the reader. This yeah. book, for those who haven't read it, it's written, quote unquote, by Darren. He is the author. There's an author's note signed by Buck. That's the name that if you read it, you'll see he takes on and it's him writing this book at a remove from, from a couple years uh, from when most of it takes place. Those right. direct addresses would, to use the word that you used before we started this, would tether the reader mm -hmm. to Darren. And despite all the wild things that are taking place, they would know that, okay, there's this older, somewhat wiser Darren. I'm going to continue to invest time in this narrative, no matter how difficult and uncomfortable I may be because I think that there will be uh, a return on investment, you know, or yeah. it'll be worth my time. Two is it's what was most interesting to me at the reader when I came up with that idea. I said I haven't seen this in many books in this way. Plus um, one. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Let me backtrack. It's what would be most interesting to me as the writer, right? I was thinking about myself too that it would make it more engaging for me, and hopefully that would translate to the reader. And the third thing I would say is I did want to double as a sales manual. Not right. just being an engaging narrative, but I hoped that anyone who read the book would be able to take away a few gems and things not to do from Darren's own journey. But also, um, if they were getting lost because there's so much going on, there are these direct addresses where it's offset from the preceding and succeeding paragraphs. Mm -hmm. They're bolded. They say, reader, there are these gems and pieces of advice that would help them potentially gain a basic proficiency in sales, or at least feel empowered to advocate for themselves more and the those who they love. That's what I was hoping, that was my intention. Um, I appreciate that as a reader you know, of any book, but this was, I, I don't think, I'm just trying to think back um, to my reading list of late or even of the past. I had not seen anything like this, not in this way where it was so um, bold, yeah. but then also, it felt like you were sitting there talking to me directly with some of these direct addresses when they popped in, because of course, unless you jump ahead, you don't really know when they're coming. Yeah. Um, so as the reader, I really appreciated that. One of the other things I want to call out, and I called this out before when you and I were talking, is the are the quotes. Mm. So many beautiful quotes. Um, you know, from wonderful people, but not the standardized things that we're going to see. You know, on social media or you know, uh, in someone's signature line. Yeah. Uh, and the one that I wanted to bring up is something that I brought up before, but it's um, it's a quote by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And it says, the good and the great are only separated by the willingness to sacrifice. Yeah. Do you think that's true? I think in Darren's case, in general, okay. in life, uh, I'm not sure. It would really depend on how someone defines good and great. The the line is so fine for so many people or yeah. so many of us don't even ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing that I was trying to do with this book is put the responsibility on the reader to define things for themselves, Yeah, define success, to define right and wrong, um, because much happens in this book and it's very easy to make these moral judgments of mm -hmm. Darren or other people. So yeah. I wanted to place the responsibility on the reader, but going back to those quotes, those quotes are at the beginning of every part of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and there's quotes from <laughs> even Jesus Christ, 
yeah. JC himself and, and other people. And each quote is supposed to give you a vibe of what that next part is going to be like. Mm -hmm. um, so that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar quote is intended to show people that Darren is either going to do what he needs to do in order to go from good to great or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think the reason why the quote resonates with me um, is it's the willingness part. Mm. I think that there's something around understanding where you're going in your life and what steps are you willing to take to get there. Yes. But I also think around the willingness part, there is the cautionary tale that's kind of hiding around every single step that you are planning out for yourself. Um, because there's a choice within a choice. So it's, I want to take this first step to jump from Idaho to New York mm -hmm. and I'm going to get myself into this master's program or this school. Um, but I don't have the money to do it. So I think I may go this other Avenue to get this money so that I can go to school. Like yeah. there's several ways to kind of look at that. But the reason why the quote sticks to me is because of the, 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 the word willingness and what that means for every single person at every single stage that they're charting their path for themselves. Yeah. And, um, and sacrifice stands out too. I yeah. Mean, sacrifice is, is relative, but um, I would say that anyone, and, and I hesitate to make a, a generalization like this, but yeah. I would think that anyone who has attained large levels of success, however they define it, mm -hmm. will at some point have to sacrifice. And I'm not talking about waking up early, <laughs> even though that could be a sacrifice for some people. I'm talking about really sacrificing meaningful things, time with friends and family, mm -hmm. at times your health. Yeah. So sleep does play into that. Mm -hmm. um, things that we can't get back. So to answer the question that you asked when you proposed the, when you proposed the quote, I would say that, uh, yes, I do believe that you know, people who attain levels of success that they define as great do at some point have to sacrifice meaningfully. I would agree with that too. Um, it, yeah, I would agree with that too. Like I said, I think I'm gonna put that on a bumper sticker somewhere <laughs> or a t-shirt or something, a headband. Um, so I think we're in a good place right now to start taking questions um, from the audience. Let's start with this first one. Hi, Lauren. Hi, hey, Lauren. Um, Looking forward to reading the book. Were there books you read previously that inspired this one? Thanks for the question, Lauren. Um, I'm not going to say there were any I read that directly inspired this. Uh, I didn't, you know, have to do any research into sales or, or startups. I, I just mm. lived that. So um, all of this came from my mind or part of my experience. But there is one book that I read just before I began writing Black Buck that I said, "Whoa, this one." went hard and maybe I can too. And that book was The Sellout by Paul oh. Beatty. And oh. when I read The Sellout, I said, this is so wild. And not only was it published, but he won the Man Booker Prize, a very prestigious international um, literary prize for, for those you know who, who haven't heard of it before. And I, I told myself that I would love to aspire to write a book that maybe doesn't go as hard or push the envelope as hard because I'm not looking to, to just provoke for the sense of provoking. And I'm not saying that's what this book did, right. but for me, I wanted to write a book that was impactful, that was different, that pushed the envelope in the ways that I wanted to and put the responsibility on me by the end to stick the landing. Right. Um, so yeah, the sellout uh, definitely had an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm actually going to put that on my reading list. Let's go with the next question. Farah, did you experience any writer's block while writing Black Buck? And if so, how did you overcome it? Hey, Farah. Um, honestly, I didn't experience a lot of writer's block with Black Buck. And for, for people who read it, I think that can make sense. I mean, I wrote it in like, I'm not going to say a frenzy, but it was just moving at such a fast pace that the book was pulling me along after a certain point. So right. I wrote the first draft in five months. And at that point, I wasn't a full-time writer. I was consulting with tech startups across North America, helping them build and scale their sales teams. So mm -hmm. I wasn't as firmly entrenched in the world of sales and startups. I was more so on my own schedule, but I was in right. them at an arm's length. This means that I couldn't just sit down and write every day. I had okay. to find time to write. I had to 
create my schedule in a way where I would have blocks of time to write. And when I had those blocks, it was like gold. I was ready to go. And I just wrote. And uh, the book wasn't plotted out from A to Z from the beginning. I was figuring it out as I was going. At most, maybe a week, a week and a half in advance, would I know what was going to take place in the book, which I did on purpose so that it would feel fresh and spontaneous in a way um, to myself while writing it, but also the reader when they would eventually, hopefully, read it. At that point, I had yeah. no agent. I, no one knew who I was at all. Right. Um, if, if at any point I did get stuck, then when I was writing this, I was writing this at uh, my parents' house in my childhood bedroom. I had left the city. Um, I had left left um many things behind and i was basically isolated in my childhood bedroom that was mm -hmm. renovated now and my my old bed was gone and everything because my parents never thought i was going to be back mm -hmm. so that hunger was just pulsating pulsating out of me and uh i bring this up to say that if any point i was lost i'd go out into nature there's a lot yeah. of nature on long island and and in places in, in those types of areas um so i'd go into nature i would just breathe good air for an hour or two. Um, and if I was also stuck at any point, I just push through. Yeah. I would know that uh, I'll put something in the book now and this doesn't mean that I can't revise later on. And, and that's what would happen in many cases. Okay, next question. Oh, Harmony, love reading Black Book. Thanks for chatting with us. How do you think companies can avoid that toxic culture of self-importance while making sure that the work feels valuable and worthwhile each day? Hey, Harmony, thanks for that question. Well, I would say is, you know, not making what someone does or what they are doing in an organization the end all be all. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, what lends itself to this toxic corporate culture or toxic uh, startup culture is that people say that this has to be your life. Yeah. This has to consume you. This organization's mission has to be yours. And if not, you're just not cut out for it. You're right. not one of us. You're not supposed to be here. And then people begin substituting their intrinsic worth for whether they hit their sales number, for whether they wrote good marketing copy that yielded a high conversion rate from a landing page, or right. whether they created a lot of elegant code that won't result in technical debt. There's so many different ways you know, that it manifests. So I would say that having people at the quote unquote top, the people leading the organization, recognize people's value to them over and over because of who they are, not what they do, and genuinely mean it. Right. Because, you know, there's so much lip service and just so much BS that takes place that this will yield a culture that is not without problems, mm -hmm. but can rectify those problems over time and is actually inclusive of a wide variety of people and a wide variety of thinking um, and will just be a more inviting place. So we could talk about this for hours. Yeah, I'm also just a guy who happened to work in tech, who had some of these experiences and then wrote a book about it, right? There, there are folks who are uh, certified in diversity and inclusion. And uh, well, I would say that maybe not, not everyone, you know, who just has that title is, uh, is able to lead the way that many of them can. Absolutely. And believe me, plus one to that, I work in the space. Uh, it is not an easy that space. That would be one of them. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know I do what I can. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I think we have one more question. All right. Uh, Malia, really looking forward to reading the book. Did you experience any trauma reliving your time at past startups? Thanks, Malia. Um, this is hard. I, I'm not going to say that I that I experienced reliving trauma from the workplace, again, to keep it a buck, to be honest, um, while I was in, <laughs> while I was in the, the main place that I was working at for a couple of years, there were things that were difficult. I was in the sunken place, but I was also young and having the time of my life. I mean, yeah. I, was, I said I was 24, making over a hundred K. Like we would really go out to these clubs. They, they were giving us everything. It was this vacuum. It was wild, you know? And, and if someone wasn't cut out, then they just weren't cut out for it. There was, I was, I was mistaken, of course, Yeah, and I was wrong in the way that I was thinking at the time. But to, to be honest with you, to paint an accurate picture, while I was in this place, until my eyes began to open up, mm -hmm. I was having a great time. When I was writing Black Buck, though, and I was unpacking a lot of things, I was thinking about my relationships with certain people. 
Mm -hmm. And that was difficult at times. Yeah. My relationships with people in that organization, my relationships with people outside that organization um, who were in my life and who loved me, but who I wasn't loving in the ways that they needed to be loved. So there were, there were many things that I had to unpack and had to process and have to work through. And now where this book has been out and I've been having, you know, so many conversations about my life, about this book, about systemic racism, so many things, I have to check in with myself every once in a while and say, yo, are you okay? Right. Are you okay? Because you're talking about these things so often. And and you're 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 being asked to bring up so much all the time. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. I don't probably do it as much as I need to, but uh, it it is something that at times is at the uh, is at the forefront of my mind. Yeah, I mean, I I thank you for all of the questions for those of you that submitted the questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I like the checking in part, right? Yeah. Like self care is not. It's everything from whether it's meditation, breathing, exercise, hanging out, taking a break, whatever that thing is. But the checking in with yourself is the umbrella of all of that. Yeah. And um, it's super easy right now, especially because we're all working virtually. Uh, some folks are back at work. But at the end of the day, we've all experienced this kind of wave of virtual fair for the most part where we're, yeah. we've just been in meetings all day but and we don't know how to turn ourselves off when we're working because now yeah. we're at home or working from a virtual office um etc and so i think that just having that permission giving yourself permission to be okay to cut things off to cut yep. the day off etc that's definitely something i've had to dig into myself mm -hmm. um what kinds of things are you doing you know for yourself now that this amazing delicious book is published and it's in the UK as of today, yes. what are you doing with yourself? Are you taking a breather? Are you headed to this next book? What's happening? So I'm working. Yeah, I'm working on another book. Uh, I'm working on projects related to Black Buck, but I'm also working at staying balanced, being present for mm -hmm. those in my life who uh, loved me before I ever wrote a word, right. as well as being present for people who are reading the book and enjoy it as much as I can. Um, I'm never going to take for granted that people are reading my work. I'm not mm -hmm. going to sit here and say, oh, I just hoped one person would read it. No, come on. I wrote this. I wanted as many people as possible right. to read it. Let's um, be real. <laughs> I'll never take it for granted. So if I get a message and we'll see what happens to use a tech word at scale, right? But if I get a message, I'm going to try to reply, even if it takes me a couple of weeks or a month or so, um, because I remember being again in my childhood bedroom dreaming of this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, those are a couple of things I'm doing to take care of myself, meeting up with people, you know, who ground me, um, eating healthy food, exercising. I've been running a bunch yeah. and um, just knowing again that my worth isn't wrapped up in me being this writer. Yeah. And that no yeah. one else's worth is wrapped up in them being, you know, who whoever or excuse me, whatever they do. But, mm -hmm. you know, more so trying to just respect people's humanity. I, listen, I enjoy them. Respecting people's humanity. Yeah, trying. what they need. Um, being more mindful of where people are at the moment that you meet them. Yep. Uh, everyone's baseline is not the same thing, right? And sometimes you don't meet people at their baseline. Uh, and that's another thing, another lesson, another uh, sentiment to kind of lean into. Yeah. But, um, shifting to something that's a little more lighthearted, talk to us about your favorite foods. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my favorite foods. I, I love Mexican food. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love, oh man, I love uh, really what I like. And I'm, I'm hesitant now because I'm like, all right, I don't know if this is about to like, I'm going to look like I'm slipping right now. I love these bowls that I get from this one Mexican place in Brooklyn that mm -hmm. has, you know, your rice, your corn, your pico de gallo, a little bit of salad. Uh, yeah. I'm a vegetarian. So it has some form of like a soy chicken or soy meat um, <laughs> with your beans. Like my mouth is watering thinking about it. I love that type of Mexican food. I love Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. I love Indian uh, chana masala with some garlic naan. But what I would say is my comfort food is ackee and dumplings, you know, mm. just Jamaican staples. I'm not going to say mm. ackee and saltfish again, vegetarian, so I don't get down with that. But whenever I go to my parents' house 
and my mom is just making some, she's simmering up some ackee. She gets the scotch bonnet in there, some mm. onions, and then gets some dumplings on the side. Just reminds me of uh, home and growing up and my roots and it uh, it's meaningful. So yeah, those are a couple of my favorite foods. What about you? Listen, I'm over here writing this down. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <Yeah, word>. so. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, so I, listen, I love all Asian fare, mm. uh, more specifically uh, digging into Thai food. Thai food is, is delicious. So good. Uh, <laughs> I love the spices. I love the flavor. Um, and then of course, as I said before, when you and I were talking, I love the Southern fare. So mm. we can, dive into soul food. Um, there's this great documentary that just came out, I believe, or docu-series. Saw it that on Netflix. Out. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I've just been watching that too. And it's so amazing and meaningful that the just something as simple as remembering that a lot of the foods that we eat, uh, more specifically Southern fare, mm -hmm. among other things, um, originated from the Africanists. Yep. and from the Africans and from the slaves. And a lot of people do not know that. Um, and so okra? I have an affinity. Say it again. Okra? Oh. Mm. Come on. Mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Delicious, okay. Yeah. yeah, a slimy vegetable, but yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness i'm thinking about maybe i'll have soul food tonight as a matter yeah, of fact there's a couple of soul food joints by my house so yeah. we will think about that um i think we just have a few more moments i want to close with just uh, a positive sentiment from you in telling folks your advice around having vision for your life and how it has helped you move from being in this tech sales uh, hyperactive, hyper octane environments of startups, tech industry, et cetera, mm -hmm. to being someone who has really drilled down and been focused on your dreams, mm -hmm. um, the things that you've really wanted for your life since you were a kid. Yeah. Um, sometimes people ask me, they say, you know, Mateo, your, your journey to becoming a writer, what would you have done differently? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it sounds foolish, but I say, not too much, to be honest. Yeah. Every misstep still brought me here. Yeah. Having published not just a book, but the book that I wanted to write and having it resonate with people, of course, not all people, but having it resonate with people the way that I wanted it to. Mm -hmm. um, but what has helped me along the way is always asking myself, what is my purpose? Yeah. And this is big. And it, it sounds, you know, um, it sounds intense at times, but asking myself, what is my life's purpose? I've asked myself that ever since I was a kid and yeah. it hasn't always changed. It hasn't always been the same. It's changed over time. Mm -hmm. But if I know at any point in time what my life's purpose is, then that will more so be the driving force yeah. um, behind all that I do and all that isn't serving my life's purpose. It's not like we can just live into our life's purpose every day, right? right. My parents' generation and, and maybe yours as well, they mm -hmm. weren't, what's my passion in life? I really need to follow, no, they had to get this bread. You know, they right. had to provide for people. Um, so we can't always, this isn't some rosy, like just follow your passion and then you get an Etsy and then you do this and that and then you're making, you know, $500,000. That's not what this is. But through knowing what my life's passion is at any point in time, it's an anchor, Yeah, the guide, and it helps me know know what is falling into that and what's falling outside of that and then still making a choice of what I'm going to pursue and what I might not be in love with, but I still need to pursue in order to get to where I want to be. Yeah. Um, the last thing I would say is it's connected to the first part, which is be okay and embrace just making mistakes Yeah. and knowing that mistakes are fine, but that um, if you stay grounded and you stay focused, Mm -hmm. then you will hopefully still get to where you want to be. Be kind to yourself. Just be kind to yourself. There's so much pressure we place on ourselves and other people place on. And I understand where it comes from, but try to be kind to yourself. I am so with that. Uh, believe in the road that you're on. And yes. everything will turn into where it's supposed to be. I believe that wholeheartedly. Mateo, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much you, for your thank time. Thank you for your time today. I so appreciate it. We all appreciate it. And to everyone watching, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the long weekend and take care of yourself and your community. Cheers. Blessings, everyone. Thank you.